Greg or um, Dean here had asked me to come up with some ideas about possibly doing some uh, doing a lecture, and so I was initially playing with the idea of talking about uh, my dissertation research. And I started playing around with it, and I wasn't sure if I would be able to compress 130 pages into an hour and still do it justice and have you clear on what we were doing. Uh, so one of the things I decided that I would like to talk about actually kind of stemmed from my research and brought some awareness to uh, a topic that I didn't realize that there was an issue with. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, research in um, social sciences. Uh, and the issue that I found when I was trying to do my research. And so I'll give you a kind of a brief overlap of what my research was about. That way you'll have a better idea how this came about. All right, so looking at social science research. When we think of research, we generally tend to think of science research. We think about uh, medical experiments, drug and alcohol, t or drug tests and trials, and uh, finding new great scientific things, outer space exploration. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that there's also a lot of research that goes into the areas of social science, uh, economics, politics, sociology, psychology, all of these things we're constantly uh, studying and looking at different things. And so it looks a little bit different than traditional scientific research. It's still done in a scientific manner, uh, but we can't use the same things. Um, sometimes experiments in the social sciences end up being a little unethical, and we'll cover that a little bit. Uh, but what we are looking for are things that can make changes to society to help us live better, things that are directly related to human behaviors and activities. So, for example, a social scientist in any of those above fields might look at a research question, uh, questioning, you know, a particular region or area and want to know uh, how many people in that area are addicted to opiates. And so it seems like a simple counting exercise, but just doing that type of research, we can get a lot of information about the opioid addiction and problems that we see. So for example, they might look at why are some areas have, why do some areas have higher addiction rates than others? Uh, what makes people of a certain area become addicted or not become addicted? Um, how do we change them? Uh, are there rehabs or are there resources in those communities to help fight addiction? So social research is more about making the world a better place. It's not so much about finding new and great things. It's more about taking what we have and making it a better place for everyone. So who does social research? Uh, so that depends on where you're at. Uh, we also obviously have to worry about finances. You know, who's going to fund research? So a lot of it actually gets done by graduate students. Uh, those pursuing master's degrees or uh, PhDs often do a lot of research. Uh, professors at universities and colleges, scientists, uh, private companies do research. A lot of times their research is more geared towards uh, what it is they're trying to profit from. So in social sciences, a lot of the big rehab companies uh, we'll do a lot of research concerning drugs and who's addicted and what. That way they know where to put certain treatment centers and what kind of treatments work versus those that don't. So there's a lot of private companies that do research there. Uh, the government also does research. Uh, and a lot of that is actually social research. So uh, anytime you're looking at a census report, that's all social information that we can use. And so sometimes we can tap into resources that are already there like the census um, and other government documents. Other times, uh, we work in cooperation with those private companies. When they find something interesting, sometimes they're uh, able to share it or willing to share it, sometimes not so much. But a lot of it comes from schools. So one of the areas that researchers have to be very careful with are protected populations. And when we say protected populations, a number of things immediately come to thought. Who are we protecting and what are we protecting them from? Uh, so we generally have what we consider seven areas of protected populations in research, especially in social research. Uh, first one being children. 
So anyone under the age of 18, uh, there are more stringent uh, guidelines when you go under the age of 12 and then again under the age of five. Uh, prisoners or inmates, pregnant women, uh, any activity involving fetuses or human in vitro fertilization. Um, that's why we hear a lot of question about uh, stem cell research uh, and, and you know, how they perform that. Uh, people with cognitive disabilities or mental health issues, um, those who are economically or educationally disadvantaged, uh, and then other potentially vulnerable groups. So we have like a, that's your escape for if we can, can't put someone in one of those other categories, but it seems like they may be at disadvantage and be able to be taken advantage of. Uh, we go and we can place them under group number seven. Okay, so why do we need protections? Uh, I'd like to say that all research has been great and wonderful and safe and effective and healthy for everyone. Unfortunately, we know that's not the case. And if we go back through our psychology books in Psychology 101 or Sociology 101, uh, we see a whole lot of experiments that we got some really good information out of, uh, but people got hurt in the process. So one of those studies uh, involves baby Albert, He's a pretty famous experiment. I believe it was from the 1940s. Uh, and so what we found out from baby Albert was that uh, if you take a baby and we introduce him to a fuzzy creature, in this case a rat, is what they started with, uh, baby didn't react to the rat at all. The baby doesn't know anything about the rat. And what they decided to try was if we put the rat in front of Albert and then we bang the symbols or we make a really loud noise, the baby gets scared and the baby cries. That's what babies do. But what they figured out was that if we presented the rat and the banging over and over again, Albert would be conditioned to be afraid of the little furry thing. So even when we didn't, ha it got to the point where even when there was no banging, whenever he saw the rat, he automatically started to cry. And so they continued with the experiment. They didn't just stop with a rat. They said, well, wait a minute. If he gets afraid of the rat, what if we tried other things? And so we brought in a bunny. And that's an actual picture of baby Albert with the bunny. And obviously, he is upset by the bunny. And so they continued with the experiment. And they continued until it got to the place where even things like men with fuzzy beards scared Albert. And he would start to cry. So, did we get information about human conditioning and how the mind works? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but we ended up kind of messing up baby Albert for life. Uh, there's some documented research about uh, how he handled that trauma as a child, and it wasn't real well. They just kind of said, hey, thanks for your participation, bye. Uh, and so he had some big issues that he had to deal with later in life. So we do recognize that there are certain groups that are more vulnerable because of their circumstances. Obviously, children can't uh, make an educated decision for themselves about whether or not they want to participate in research. Um, other groups, like pregnant women, uh, you know, you have to take into consideration, and yes, the mother can authorize the research, but does the child really get a choice uh, in the matter, and what could it possibly do to them? Um, so the protected population that I chose to work with uh, were inmates. So I was working at the time in a correctional institution. I worked in corrections. Uh, I worked for a total of about 12 years in corrections. And so the whole time I was pursuing my PhD, I knew that I wanted to do some type of a research project involving inmates. And everybody warned me right off over and over and over again. This is a protected population. You're going to have a really hard time getting approval to do it. But I was stubborn and adamant that uh, this was a group that I worked with on a daily basis. And I saw some things going on that I thought were worthy of research. And so I decided to pursue the protected population of inmates. And so like the baby Albert experiment, inmates have had some pretty uh, horrific experiments done on them. Uh, at one point uh, in history, it was not uncommon to, for drug or pharmaceutical companies to slip the warden some money, and he would give you as many inmates as you wanted to try your drugs on. Not always very ethical, uh, and a lot of them are hurt. So they become a protected population because they're wards of the state and we're responsible for them. 
So I went into this knowing that I was probably going to have a difficult time getting research permission. Uh, one thing I was very hopeful about was that one of the, a lot of the sources that I looked at basically said that if you do want to research this population, being an insider in that field gives you a lot better odds. You know the right people, you know policy, you know procedure, uh, and you're a lot more likely to be able to get them to agree to let you do your research if you're an insider. So I thought I had that going for me. So when did I realize that there was a problem? So I, my dissertation took a couple of years to put together. A lot of research, a lot of writ literature. Um, so I started narrowing down on a topic when I was doing one of my doctoral classes. I was doing a policy analysis class and we had to pr pick a uh, public policy that we wanted to dissect and map out. And so at the time, the Prison Rape Elimination Act was very, very big. Uh, it had passed and a lot of states were scrambling to put into effect uh, different conditions to make sure they were in compliance with this act. And so that was the policy that I decided to dissect and analyze. Uh, and so when I was looking at that policy, I was also looking back over my years working in the prison. So it was passed, the Prison Rape Elimination Act was passed in 2003. So I wasn't even working in the prison at that point. Um, but when they passed it, they gave the prison so many years to come into compliance. They did a little bit of studying about what was needed from that. And as I was coming into the system, prisons were really starting to make some big changes as to how they handled things, uh, documenting th rapes and assaults, um, segregating housing, uh, looking at how we handle transgender inmates and things like that. So as I was watching all this unfold and dissecting this policy, I noticed that the, the people who were primarily affected by this bill and these laws really didn't have any say so. Nobody was asking either the staff who worked inside of the prison with the inmates on a daily basis or the inmates themselves what they thought of it. Nobody asked, do you like it? Do you not like it? What's working? What's not working? And for a lot of these guys who had lived in prison for years, it was making huge changes to their lives. Things that they had done the entire time that they had been locked up we're all of a sudden going out the window and we're doing all new stuff. And nobody bothered to ask, do you think it works? Does it not work? And I had a lot of inmates say, you know, I don't understand why we're doing this. This is dumb. Little things. Um, you know, guys who used to uh, take their shirts off and go out in the yard and pump weights or work out or all of a sudden no longer allowed to take their shirts off. Female officers now had to yell female on the block whenever they came onto a housing unit. And so as I watched this, I heard them ask occasionally about, uh, you know, how do the wardens or the administrators feel about having to be in compliance, but nobody asked the inmates. Um, so I did my literature review and there was nothing. No one had ever asked the inmates, how do you feel about this? What do you think about the changes? Are they working? Um, in fact, I found very, very little research about prison rape itself uh, or sexual assault or any of those issues. Uh, as I dug, spanning the last 50 years, I would say there were probably only about 20 studies that had anything to do with inmates in prison uh, concerning prison rape. And none of them asked opinions or how to solve the problem. So I decided that that was what I was gonna do. I was going to get the attitudes and the opinions of the inmates and the staff who worked inside of the prisons on a daily basis and see what they had to say. Uh, so before anybody would touch it, I had to get approved by the IRB of my institution, the in, uh, Institutional Review Board. Uh, and it was kind of brutal. Uh, so, you know, they emphasized that this is a protected population. Uh, you're going to have to be really, really careful. We can't have anything. Uh, that's going to break confidentiality. Uh, we need to make sure that these people are safe. Uh, and, and so we went to work. So I had initially wanted to interview inmates. Um, but after talking with the IRB, 
uh, we came to the conclusion there was really no safe way that I could pull inmates in for interviews without other people knowing what they were doing. Even though I worked inside of the prison and I talked to you know 20 inmates a day, even if I did it within my own prison, somebody would be able to make guesstimates about who were the ones who were interviewed when I was quoting them in my research. So I put in a lot of footwork uh, and came up with a system where we could interview inmates via the mail, which took, again, a little bit of juggling because inmate mail is always checked. Everything that comes in and out of the facility is opened and read. Um, so it, it took a little bit of finagling, uh, but I found ways around getting those things not opened by staff and being able to get safe, confidential information back to me as the researcher. Uh, I even got a research grant from uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, which was where I was doing my research. Um, they thought it sounded like such a great project that they gave me $1,000 to help with the postage and get my research underway. So I'm so excited. I'm ready to start. Uh, and so I went to the Department of Corrections that I worked for, uh, who had for years been telling me, we love research, we want to help our inmates, let's go, yeah. And I sent them my proposal and less than 24 hours later I was denied. Like less than 24 hours, like I didn't even think you could read it that fast. Um, even though the IRB had already passed it and said this is from our level, very foolproof, it, w this can work. So they sent me a list of things that they asked me to change in order for them to consider it. And so I spent an entire weekend reworking it, finagling, changing some things, and I sent it back. Within 48 hours, I was denied the second time, at which point I called my, uh, the head of my committee and I said, I, I won't do it with them. Um, one of the things that they wanted me to do was they wanted me to have to disclose what inmates I was working with. And I said, I'm not willing to risk their safety in order to get it done. I just won't do it. I would rather not do the research. Um, so at this point, I am absolutely panicking. How am I going to get this research done? Uh, if the department that I work for won't approve it, who's going to approve this? Um, so over the weekend, I'm brainstorming. I mean, I've got like five years of research and work in this. Like, what do I do with it? How do I, I mean, I have literally two years left uh, on the time my graduate research started to get this done, or else I'm not going to get my PhD. The doctorate is done and dead in the water. You only get so much time. So, and then it hit me. If they denied it, what if other places deny it? What if I could get someone else to pick it up? And so I'm planning in my head. And so what I came up with was I am going to send this proposal to every state in the United States of America. Every state in the United States of America either has a Department of Corrections or they contract with someone who does. And so I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send it to all 50 states. If somebody picks it up, I'll do my research. Great. If no one picks up my research, then I have a dissertation about why nobody is picking this up. Because I felt like it was a really important topic that somebody needed to tackle. Uh, so I sent out 49 uh, applications. So uh, before I sent them out, and some of these were a lot of work. So every state uh, has their own research requirements, some more thorough than others. And you're probably asking, why 49 out of 50? Um, by the time I got to sending them out, one of the states, the application was 40 pages and it had to be notarized um, and it was pretty in-depth and detailed, so I actually did not send out the one to that state. Um, some of these applications had eight pages. Uh, some of the states had their own IRB and they didn't care what my R IRB said. I had to go through their IRB. Uh, so I sent out 49 applications to do my research. I had one state approve my research, one out of 49. So the state of Kentucky got a hold of me, and uh, they said, we would, like, we would love for you to do this research. Um, there were a couple who contacted me back and said that for whatever reason, it wasn't the right time and place. They were interested, 
um, but they couldn't do it. So I believe it was Iowa told me that they were really interested, but they had had a couple of uh, inmate on inmate homicides uh, that they were in a kind of a messy state trying to clean things up. Uh, and it just wasn't a good time to come into the institution and do any research at that point, but that they were interested. So I had Kentucky approve me. I had 17 outright denials, and they said, no way. I had 31 who either didn't respond back or said that they would review it and get back to me and then never did. Okay, so what was the purpose of my research? What was I trying to do and why did I think it was so important? So like I said, the Prison Rape Elimination Act passed into law into 2003. Um, and so basically what it said was that the federal government was, making you go was going to make you put into practice certain things concerning the rape of inmates to prevent and stop sexual assaults inside of the prison environment. And the reason it affected so many people was that the states either had to participate or they risked losing their federal funding. So if they were getting any kind of funding from the federal government for corrections and they decided not to comply with those regulations, the money supply would get cut off. So it kind of forced a lot of people's hands. Uh, so there were a number of changes to policies and procedures that had to get pushed through in order for jails and uh, prisons uh, and even ICE holding facilities to put into place in order for them to be compliant and still receive those federal monies. So like I said, there had been no research conducted at that point on how this was affecting them. Um, by the time I actually started the research, some of the states had had policies and procedures in place for PREA for over seven years. And at no time during that seven years had anybody asked the inmates, is it working? Is it not working? Do you like it? Do you not like it? What are some things that maybe we're doing that are unnecessary or things that we could do better? Um, and I, I just kept thinking to myself, shouldn't we just check with the people who are actually in prison to make sure it's working? So why is it important? So inmates who have been sexually assaulted also have higher risks of suicide. Uh, they often suffer bigger mental and physical health issues uh, that can become even more complicated within a prison environment. They don't have free access to uh, health, good health care um, and the ability to go to someone and say, I have a problem. Counselors aren't readily available. And the fact of the matter is that most inmates are going to be released back into the streets. Over 80% of inmates that are in jail are going to get out and be in the streets. And if they're going to be in the streets, they're going to be around your mom and your dad and your children and your neighbors. They're going to be there. Do we want damaged people coming into contact with our families? And inmates who are sexually assaulted in prison are more likely to commit violent offenses, even if they weren't a violent offender before they were assaulted in prison. So I felt like this was a huge issue. Uh, it also contributes to HIV and AIDS, rate, AIDS rates, and it also contributes to the violence level within a prison. Prisons that report uh, rape and assault amongst inmates also have higher levels of inmate on inmate assault, as well as inmate on staff assault. So it's affecting correctional employees as well as the inmates themselves. So looking at some of those denials that I got, uh, Arkansas told me that it adversely impacted the security and safety of their department, its facilities, employees, inmates, and provided no benefit to their department. I kind of found that one hard to believe, but okay. I'll take that. Uh, Wyoming told me that the risks associated with this study, uh, particularly the victim survey questions, uh, could cause bigger distress for the participants, uh, especially those with victimization histories, and the resources weren't available to deal with those distressed participants once it took place. Uh, I will mention here that every state according to PREA regulations, has to have a hotline. And any PREA that gets reported, whether it happened that five minutes before or whether it happened 20 years ago in a different facility, has to be able to be dealt with once it's reported. So they, shouldn't have had, they wouldn't have had to put anything extra in place 
uh, if somebody is being plagued by trauma. Uh, New York told me that the research design was not acceptable to the state. Uh, it also did not hold value for their department. And finally, Massachusetts told me that uh, it sounded like a great idea, except that there was no way any research that they would ever do would ever release inmate or staff names so that the research could be conducted. They just don't give out inmate names to anyone, ever. Which is also kind of funny because inmate names are public policy. You can usually go online and find them. Um, the state of South Carolina told me that they won't even let uh, anyone in school uh, do research. Uh, they only deal with government researchers and they won't allow any grad or uh, PhD students or professors at any universities do research in their jails. So there were a list of denials. Others just simply sent it back and said, yeah, no. So as I was going over this with my dissertation team, one of my committee members was Dr. Swagger. And so she is a sociology professor at IUP where I went to school. Uh, and she told me, I would love to work with you on this because I had a very, very similar issue. And I kind of lucked out and I ended up having Kentucky agree to allow me to do my research. She unfortunately didn't get any takers. So uh, when she was doing her dissertation, she was looking at issues involving children, particularly the foster care system uh, and the juvenile law system. She was not able to get anyone to agree to work with her. And I started thinking to myself, Yes, children are a protected population, and it's important that we protect them, but what about their experiences? Wouldn't we think that we should be able to ask kids who are in that foster care system who don't have voices for themselves to be able to speak out and tell us what's going on? I mean, I, and then I started comparing those children to those inmates because the fact of the matter is, if an inmate has a problem with something going on within the institution, they often don't have any way to reach out to those on the outside world and let them know what's going on. Their phone calls are monitored, their letters are read, and as much as we'd like to think that people are good, honest people who would do the right thing and let those letters and complaints go through, how many of them do you think disappear every year? So, you know, looking at the my case, I was looking at inmates and how they could possibly have suggestions to make the system better. And Dr. Swagger agreed that there were children out there who probably had some really good recommendations about the system that they were trapped in, but they don't have a voice and they can't find their voice because they're protected. And so what I found was that in essence, when we're looking at these protected populations, that the administrators are pretty much gatekeepers who allow people to have or not have access to these populations uh, who probably have some very important things to say. Think about schools. You know, kids aren't supposed to have cell phones in school. No videos, no pictures. It's kind of funny. It's the same way with prison. Nobody's allowed to take a cell phone in the prison. Nobody's allowed to take pictures of it. Why? Maybe we don't want people to see what's really going on inside sometimes. So uh, I feel like there are a lot of administrators out there, and I'm not saying all of them, but I feel like there are a lot of administrators who are really taking advantage of that protected label by not allowing things like photographs uh, or interviews or controlling who comes in and out. Uh, I mean, even just going into the prison, uh, Dr. Herod and I are going to be doing a visit at Hazleton Prison. Uh, we have to fill out a background survey. There's a whole lot of stuff we have to do just to be able to get inside. You know, and so it, even just little questions, like what do their meals look like on an average day? You know, and it doesn't seem like such a big deal. You know, obviously we all like to eat nice, good, tasty food. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, in prison, we're not always looking for what tastes good. We're looking to hit a caloric value. Well, if we want lots of calories, what do we get? Lots of carbs, right? And so they're eating lots of potatoes and starches because they're cheap, high in calories. And then inmates end up with other issues like heart disease, diabetes, at increased levels. Now, of course, we're not so much worried about what they're eating and if it tastes good, they're being punished, right? But as a taxpayer, how much of your money is going to pay for those medical issues 
that are inflated or increased because of their diet, right? Uh, do they have the access to the things that they need? Medical things, right? How does their medical system work? Uh, every state does it a little bit differently uh, and getting information about how their medical procedures work are almost impossible. It's one of those things we, nobody really asks uh, or if we do ask, they get brushed aside and say you don't have the necessary credentials or authority to get that information. We keep you in the dark. So while I was preparing this presentation, I looked around. There were a lot of other examples online of protected groups. Um, so one that I looked at was a patient and public involvement in the research process. Uh, and so they were looking at evaluations and what they found were that those evaluations from individuals who were under age uh, were very limited. Um, they had a very high bias. They were very selective about the ones that they let them view. Um, not every kid got a say so. Um, just like when we see people interviewed in school and prison environments, it's usually somebody who's handpicked by the principal or the superintendent or the administrator. Um, this one, the second one I was looking at was a prisoner health study uh, and they were looking at the limited access. Uh, they really wanted to get some information about prisoner health and the fact of the matter was that they couldn't get enough access to make a decent judgment. They couldn't even conclude their study because they couldn't get enough information. Uh, corrections wouldn't let them in uh, because it may reflect badly on them. And then the final one that I looked at uh, was really intriguing because it was an article uh, and it was a lady who was trying to study human trafficking. And so her goal was to talk to people who had been the victims of human trafficking. And what she concluded was that she would have a better chance at tracking down people who were still being human trafficked and in the custody of their, uh, their traffickers than she would getting a hold of those people who had been saved from human trafficking. Their access was completely denied. She said it would have been easier to get a hold of a human trafficker and say, hey, let me talk to a couple of your kids. And I would think that with that being such a huge issue in America right now that we would hope to be studying them and, and finding out everything that we can uh, from people who had been victims of it. Uh, I understand it could be traumatizing, but it also could be very liberating. It could also be used as a tool to help them move past their experiences. So that is what my study concluded, that we have quite a few protected populations uh, and access to those is very, very limited. And I feel like that at times, uh, administrators make that access even more limited. Uh, and so we're not getting the full story from those people that we could be helping with our social research. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> Wisconsin or Minnesota? I can't remember which one it was. But they had a, it was like a 40 page application and you even had to have the bottom of every page notarized. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yes, absolutely. You know, it really just depends. It's a state to state thing. Um, like I said, every state has their own policy about how they handle research. Some have special inmate research policies. Others have special child research policies. And, and it's really up to the state. Um, I think that's one of those areas where, you know, the feds could definitely step in at some point and say, maybe we should take a look at this. Um, because some of those are very, very biased or telling. Um, a lot of the states do require that there be supervision. So uh, even if you were going to do research with inmates and you could somehow get through the interview process, uh, you have to have guards sit there with you while you do the research. And how are you going to get answers if the guards are sitting right there in front of you? Um, like I said, the, the biggest obstacle I had, I really, really wanted to do interviews because I wanted to be able to kind of probe them and, and ask them what do you mean by certain things and really get in depth with their answers. Um, but that wasn't going to be able to be possible and still protect their identities. So I came up with a, a survey. Uh, it was about what I sent to the inmates. I sent them a letter uh, explaining what the research was. Uh, and what I was using it for and what I was hoping to do and how many people I had would have participate. Uh, I did their informed consent that way. And then I sent them with that was a six page survey. And so uh, they were open ended questions, you know, questions asking things like, how do you feel your facility is doing concerning the Prison Rape Elimination Act? Did you know about this before you got there? Uh, what kind of things do they do? Do you feel like there are areas in, of your institution that aren't safe? <laughs> Wyoming actually told me that that was not a relevant question to ask the inmates. Is there, are there areas of your institution that you feel unsafe in? Uh, another question I asked, I asked how their, uh, if, how their working relationship was with the staff within the prison. Inmates who are comfortable with staff are more likely to report serious incidents. <laughs> Wyoming also told me that they didn't feel that that was a relevant question either. So there were some definite red flags, and there's really just not much of anybody to catch and say, hey, why can't they do that? It's up to the state individually. So, yeah. It would be lovely to see some kind of system where, you know, we could monitor the kids, the inmates, and make sure that we're getting accurate information. And I'm glad that they have, uh, they were able to get it through to get the ability to talk to them alone because that definitely changes their answers. Uh, and I'll be honest, I, I sent out a thousand surveys. I sent them out to a thousand inmates. Uh, Kentucky has about 6,000 inmates. And I sent out a thousand surveys to random inmates. Uh, I got about 140 of them back, which I was expecting the re return rate to be a little bit low um, because they had to hand write in their answers. There was no multiple choice. They actually had to think about it and write it out. Um, but the 140 surveys that I got back were just heart-wrenching, horrible, horrible stories, people who admitted abuse uh, and told their stories, and some of them would say, uh, you know, I'm going to put this out here and I hope it helps somebody else, but I'm never ever going to admit that this is what happened to me. Uh, when I sent those surveys out, I asked that they not put their name or their identification number or any kind of detailed information, like their term of their sentence or anything like that. I didn't want any of that information. I would say 75% of the surveys I got back had their names and said, please share it. If it could help someone else, use my information. Um, and, and I had guys who I was worried that, you know, maybe they would start it and answer two or three questions, get tired of it, not want to do it. Uh, they were all completely filled out. There were no questions. And I put on, when I sent the instructions, I said, if there's something here that makes you uncomfortable uh, or that you don't want to talk about, feel free to skip that question because I don't want to make your life any harder for talking about your situation. No one skipped any of the questions, and I actually had guys who attached extra pages uh, so they could give more detailed answers and information 
uh, and they had they paid the extra expense at their on their own dime to mail me he heavier envelopes so that they could get their point across. So uh, I just finished uh, in I finished it up last May, uh, and so I reviewed some more things and I put together a, a very thorough packet for the state of Kentucky, uh, and I sent that back to them. Uh, at the end of last year uh, for them to review that information and hopefully they can make some changes to their system that will benefit those inmates. But I felt it really important to make sure that I did a really thorough job of uh, pointing out all the information that I received and, and being able to use some of those examples without identifying information. Any identifying information I kept um, to make sure that they wouldn't get a hold of it. But I felt like it was really important that Kentucky get that information. Uh, and some of it I put in direct quotes because I wanted it to be in their own words. Other questions? Yeah. I think part of it has to do with the fact that, yes, these are protected populations, but they're also populations that don't have very much voice. Um, when you think about children, people often dismiss kids. Yeah, they're kids. You know, and, and when we talk about inmates, uh, we're often looking at them as people who have done some type of damage to society and ended up in prison and so we automatically assume that they're bad people or uh, this is just punishment for their bad choices um, they're making things out to be worse than they really are and, and in fact we don't know how bad they are because normal everyday people don't get access to prisons or orphanages or foster care homes um, usually they're given a heads up when people are coming to visit and everybody shines up and is all bright and cheery and they clean up. My husband's laughing because he worked in corrections with me. Uh, it's my fault I got him started. Uh, but one of the things that they would do whenever we would have an inspection or, uh, so I was the PREA coordinator for the facility and they would do trainings right before our audit. They would purposely pull inmates in and say they're going to interview you. And they handpicked which inmates they wanted to talk to the auditor. They handpicked which staff. He never got to talk. He tends to open his mouth and his filter's not real good. So he didn't ever get to talk to the auditors. <laughs> but they handpicked those people. And so, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and not only that, happy. Inmates who have food, so when we're looking at prior history, because I've been, you know, I do lots of correctional research. I'm a dork like that. I love research. Uh, when we look at riots, one of the things almost always associated with a prison riot is some type of change to their food. Stand all day long 
Absolutely. So <laughs> I was working in a prison. It was a, it was a super max facility. Uh, and so food quality had went down. Uh, noticeably the inmates weren't getting as much food and it wasn't the same quality they had changed contractors went cheaper um, and so the inmates protested and so one of the ways that they protested was the guys that were in the hole would throw their food at the guard when the guard would slip their tray in they would throw the food at the guard and so the punishment for throwing your food at the guard meant that you ate loaf and loaf is basically whatever we had for dinner that day put in a blender baked into a cake and that's what you ate. I can't even imagine what loaf tastes like. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of example. Instead of looking at it as a legit concern, maybe we should look at this. We'll fix you. We'll make it so that you don't talk. So we're not going to let you protest or else you're going to have to eat loaf. Yeah, it's just kind of a disturbing system to me that they, they really don't have a voice. You know, and, and it's horrible to think about with inmates. It's horrible to think about with children. And I just feel like there should be some type of way that we should be able to regulate uh, having people with some proper authority who aren't going to get paid off or whose job is in at stake to step in and look at these environments and, and see what's working and what's not. Right, and so that's one of my that's one of my biggest complaints. Every prison that I have ever worked at, the warden or the superintendent or whoever was in charge of that facility had an office outside of the fence. They weren't working with inmates on a daily basis. They didn't see those backstories. And you know, I went into prison not knowing what to expect. Uh, and, and what I found was a lot of people with a lot of backstory and a lot of needs mental health needs, uh, physical health needs, um, that they can't get fixed in the prison system and it continues to lead them back. Um, when I first started in prison, I was a drug and alcohol counselor. And so uh, several years into it, one of the local schools asked me to come and talk for Red Ribbon Week. Uh, and first of all, I had to take my own personal time to go and talk about jail at Red Ribbon Week because the uh, the state wouldn't authorize me to say anything because they didn't know what I was going to say. So you can't go on company time. So I took my own personal time and I went to talk to these elementary school kids about drugs and alcohol and why it was important to bring awareness to these issues. And so I asked them first and foremost, what is a prison or what is a jail? And somebody immediately said, that's where we send bad people. And I told them no. That's not where we send bad people. That's where we send people who have done bad things. Because I knew that in that room, somebody's uncle, somebody's dad, somebody's grandfather had been to jail, and that kid knew it. What are you doing when you label them as bad or a problem to society? It's not going to fix anything. And if you don't fix the problem, they just continue to come back again and again and again. Any other questions? Well, thank you for coming out and listening to me.